is AMD's latest flagship gaming CPU, the Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, a scam. And recently I watched uh, two videos from different tech tubers, one from a channel called Frame Chasers, who was saying this uh, CPU is just straight out scam from AMD. They're selling eight cores packaged in a 16 core package and then labeling it as a 16 core gaming CPU. And then there was a response from Gordon from PC World where they sort of were saying that people in the comments were saying that it was a scam. But then when I looked through the comments of Gordon's video, I didn't see anyone saying it was a scam. So Gordon was kind of like referring to the Frame Chasers video, but then didn't refer to the Frame Chasers video. So I'm not kind of sure what's going on there. I mean, Gordon, if you just see people's content online and you watch it and you get the idea to make a video or respond to a video like that, there's no harm in just saying, I saw this person's video, I watched it, and this is my opinion on the matter. It really doesn't make a difference. I mean, no one's going to lose sleep over a YouTube video on the internet. Anyhow, that being said, I decided to do a heap of different testing here today, emulating a 7950X3D versus a Ryzen 7 7800X3D, where in the BIOS, you've got the option to disable half the cores, basically the, the cores without the 3D gaming cache on board, and then I can run tests at 1080p with an RTX 4090. I know it's unrealistic, but we're going to edge out the differences and see how these two different, or well, even though they're the same CPU, two different CPUs behave whilst we're running these tests. And the results are kind of bizarre, and we'll get onto that a little bit later. Though in terms of the arguments from both sides of the fence, I'm going to look at both of those, and in the conclusion, we'll weigh that up. But let's get into these gaming results first of all. Never pay full price for Windows 10 or 11 again. With today's video sponsor, SCD Keys, you can get activated for as little as $15 using that coupon, BFTYC. Links in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. And first of all, we get into Horizon Zero Dawn here, 1080p lowest settings. And here's where we saw 349 average FPS versus 329. So a slight victory there for the 7800X3D simulator, which is great news because this CPU is going to come in actually significantly cheaper than the 7950X3D. Then we're going to move over to Hogwarts Legacy. And here's where we saw 227 average FPS on the 7950X3D versus the 7800X3D simulated at 211 average FPS. So it was a slight victory for the 7950X3D on its average FPS. However, looking at those 0.1% lows, here is where the 7800X3D simulated actually scored a victory here. So this was actually surprising to see because ultimately I would give a trade-off in favor of the higher 0.1% lows for this particular average FPS. Because once you go under 30 in terms of 0.1% lows, those stutters actually can be quite noticeable. So let's move over to the next gaming benchmark here, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where we scored here 395 versus 391. And the results were really insignificant in terms of differences. But I will note, again, in this case, we've got the 5% lows because Shadow of the Tomb Raider does report it differently here. And we got here the minimums are higher again on the 7800X3D simulated. Then we move over to Fortnite, which is the biggest difference so far in favor of the eight core simulated uh, benchmarks here, where we got 626 average FPS versus 539. And then the 1% lows and the 0.1% lows were also higher on both. So that kind of difference was actually fascinating to see because when we look at a game like Fortnite, it's a competitive multiplayer title. And so one thing that's not really talked about when benchmarking games is that there's inherent latency delays to game engines. Certain game engines will be more laggier, as I put quotation marks in there, than other game engines. And so Fortnite is actually a very responsive game engine. And after analyzing these numbers, it was actually good to see that the cheaper product was coming out ahead. But it was also interesting to see that it was the game that showed the biggest difference in the results here today and having the best responsiveness out of all the games we tested here. So this is something that we've looked at in the past in briefly in a video, but we haven't really looked at it too much in depth. But it's something that needs to be uh, known in the gaming community is that different games will actually have 
different amounts of inherent input delay. Then moving on to the last title here, we've got Cyberpunk 2077. And here's where the 7950 X3D scored the victory over the 7800 X3D simulated. So scoring one of the four games a win here, it got the highest uh, average FPS as well as the highest minimums. And I find in Cyberpunk 2770, the minimums are very closely correlated to the 0.1% lows. So that was a victory for the 7950 X3D. So looking at those gaming numbers, they basically paint the picture of if you're a gamer and you're serious about performance, just wait for the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. It's going to be, in my opinion, not just a better value CPU, but it's also going to be a better CPU for competitive gamers, where that is, in my opinion, where the FPS matters the most. In all these other titles, we're getting very smooth FPS and the games are going to be extremely enjoyable on both options. But this is the second part of the video we're going to go into now. Is the 7950X3D a scam? And this is where... I'm looking at it and I decided to run more tests here where we decided to run a few different games in a borderless mode first off to find out the behavior of the games and whether you're losing significant performance. And here's where we lost performance in Horizon Zero Dawn much more significantly than we did on the 7800X3D simulated. So we went from 349 average FPS down to 337 on the 7800X3D simulated. Then we went down from 329 down to 295. And this 295 number is very interesting because that's the number that the 7950X non-3D will get. So moving over to Hogwarts, this game has made no difference. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, this also made no difference. Uh, Fortnite, this also made no difference yet again. And then Cyberpunk, again, made no difference. But when we started to load up now, so Gordon from PC World made this video where he was running Cinebench at the same time as he was running games. I decided to do the same tests now, but I was using a different program because if we run Cinebench and even if we set the max core affinity to say 12 cores within Cinebench itself, or even if we set the uh, core affinity to manually set the cores in Windows Task Manager. I know this is probably going to be confusing to a lot of people at the moment, but basically within Windows, you can assign which cores will run on which program. When we started doing this for Cinebench, it reset the core affinity itself. So Cinebench, you basically are locked out from manually setting core affinity in this program, but you can limit the cores within Cinebench itself to 12 threads, which is what we did here. And then when we ran this with... Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we noticed significantly lower FPS, going to uh, down to roughly 280 average FPS from that 390 figure. And so again, this is close to now around that 7950X figure. So one more test I decided to do after that was find a benchmark where we could then set the core affinity properly to the cores that aren't being used in the game and set it manually to the game itself. And so Shadow of the Tomb Raider was great for this. We could set the core affinity to the game, and we could also set the core affinity to a different benchmark here, a rendering benchmark, C1.3. And here is where we got much better results this time around. So we got 379 average FPS versus that 390 figure. So in other words, the 7950X3D, you can use those other cores whilst you're gaming and still get that 3D cache gaming performance, but it's an absolute mess in order to do this. And one thing about my channel, at least I'd like to think it gives valuable information to the average person who's going to be buying this stuff and building PCs for themselves or for friends. And when I sell PCs in the past, a lot of the times I sell PCs, it's just to the average person who wants to get into PC gaming or wants to upgrade their gaming PC and wants pretty good value. And when I do this, everyone that comes around, if you tell them, oh, this clock and that clock and you have to do this setting and that setting, they sit there and they scratch their head and they're like, dude, I just literally want to buy the PC and install the games on it and then just start gaming. So when AMD, for instance, with the 7950X3D gives a lot like this list of make sure you've got game mode on and make sure you've got this in device ID and you've got this installed, that's a lot of 
potential problems for someone who just wants to get the best gaming performance out of an X3D chip. And arguably, this is where I agree with points from frame chasers. Arguably, the person buying the X3D is looking for it for the simplicity and the performance. And simplicity being the key point there. They're just going to install the CPU into a motherboard, turn on the XMP profiles, or in this case, the Expo profiles for AM5, and then they've got good gaming performance. And in that case, I would heavily recommend waiting for the, the Ryzen 7 uh, 7800X3D because it's going to have that simplicity. I had absolutely no issues running that simulated CPU and I saw no drops in the games in terms of the expected performance. But when we went over the 7950X3D, I noticed that sometimes we can run into problems, when we're, especially when we're trying to use those extra cores. And so I think this is where a big market for the 7950X3D comes from is actually people who do want those extra cores. They're going to be gaming and then say with the extra cores, they want to start streaming or they want to uh, run, say, compile stuff in the background. Maybe they're running some other scientific benchmark and helping out a community. I don't know. The uses are there, though, when you've got eight free cores and 16 threads available. But if you're not utilizing those properly and you're getting that reduced gaming performance you're kind of going to feel like you're not getting what you paid for and in this case it feels like amd's made the cpu where the onus is on amd to make sure this cpu is running properly from the get-go but then they're saying okay it's windows problem it's the game's problem or it's the application's problem it's up to the application developers to then assign core affinity manually to the 7950X3D, which going forward, a lot of game developers are not gonna wanna do that unless they get paid money from AMD. So ultimately I get where Gordon's coming from too, from PC World, where you're getting 16 cores and eight of those cores is exactly what AMD said. They're gaming cores and they're gonna be fine when you're gaming and you're doing stuff with the other eight cores, but that's still providing the software itself and or Windows itself is optimized, which is an if, and that's the if that you're buying with the 7950X3D. <laughs> so if I was the consumer wanting to get the best gaming performance from AM5, I would just simply wait for the 7800X3D. And I think that's what a lot of reviewers have been saying out there. They're looking back at frame chases uh, and people say, oh, you know, this guy's over the top. Uh, at the end of the day, me personally in the past, I've referenced his channel because when he was talking about DDR4 and 12th gen testing, he made me alert of something when I was doing my own testing. That was the gear one versus gear two ratios. So there's value in that content. And if there's value in that content, regardless of the language they use and whether I would use that language in my videos, that's irrelevant for me. It's their channel. But at the end of the day, if there's some value in there and I can run tests and see what they're talking about and better serve my audience with better recommendations, then I appreciate having channels like Frame Chasers around. So I'm enjoying personally the different arguments and the different debates coming up. And in the case of PC World, it's fine to mention a channel's name, even if people don't like that channel and they hate that channel, it's fine to mention it. Nobody cares. It's an internet video and an opinion. They're everywhere. But then we go back to Gordon's example and I can see where he's coming from. He's saying it's not a scam and he's showing that it can run the whole 16 cores while you're gaming as well, and so therefore frame chases is wrong. But now to finally answer the question in today's video title, is the Ryzen 9 7950X3D a scam? And technically, no, it's not. But it's easy to see how it could be perceived as one, given that it's so janky in that it relies on the software either from Microsoft and or the game developers or the application developers to get that core affinity right. And that's where sort of I'm leaning away from recommending this CPU, especially to um, people who don't want to waste a whole lot of time in the BIOS, don't want to waste time with tuning, and also for people getting into PC gaming or even if they've been in it for a few years but they're just more casual and they want that best performance, wait for the 7800X3D. Though in this case, I can see how both channels can be perceived as right and or wrong. But in this case, keep making the content. I enjoy watching it, especially if it gets recommended in my feed. And that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video too. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button 
And also let us know in the comment section below what do you think about the testing that we did here today? What do you think about the debate going on with the 7950X 3D? Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. Just like this question of the day here, which comes from Kerbox92, and they ask, I am a user of hardened Firefox. Will upgrading affect anything like personal settings or simply upgrade the OS and keep everything as it is? So if you're upgrading from Windows 10 to Windows 11, so this is where the video, this is where the question comes from, there should be your settings for Firefox should remain exactly the same. Uh, it's only different settings in the base of the OS that generally change and cause problems. But that being said, whenever I personally change OSs, even with the same OS, I do a complete reinstall. And yeah, so I actually don't have firsthand experience of that. Whenever I'm moving OSs, I just reinstall, but you should be fine, at least from what I've researched. Hope that answers that question and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech yes content, be sure to hit that sub button and ring that bell and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.